Well, I think it's a very normal uh, notification period. There are considerable details to be worked out in a transition of this kind, uh, including coordination with the member governments of the alliance. Well, I uh, recognize that this seems to be interpreted with some surprise, but I had uh, informed uh, President uh, Carter and Secretary Brown almost a year ago of my intentions uh, to do this. Uh, they asked me to stay on uh, a year from last June, and that's precisely what I'm doing. This is merely a confirmation of, of the original arrangements. Not Nation. at all, and in no way. No, I don't foresee it at all. I have uh, discounted or precluded any never statements, because I don't think that's an appropriate thing to do, but I have no plans of whatsoever at this time to enter politics in any way. I would say the speculation that has followed my announcement uh, far exceeds the realities of uh, uh, future potentials. I always leave it open, but I doubt it very seriously at this juncture. I've had a few uh, approaches from here and there, but I haven't been overwhelmed by the din. Well, I make it a habit of not uh, revealing the context of discussions of that kind, but uh, I wouldn't uh, suggest an affirmative response either. No, not at all. Well, if I did, uh, I was what you call sandbag, because uh, all I did in, in that time was to attend a cocktail party I had been invited to before a formal lecture to the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Well, not enough that I uh, feel encouraged about the subject, but uh, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to, to indulge in job selections or discussions at this time. Well, I... I could consider such a thing, yes. No, it is not, frankly. And had it been, I suppose I would have picked another uh, branch of service and career. Because, as you know, the military service is not a remunerative uh, endeavor. Uh, not necessarily. I think the point uh, that I would underline is that if we hope in SALT three to achieve breakthroughs, and uh, if we hope to achieve breakthroughs, uh, on the ongoing Soviet buildup in the theater nuclear area, and I'm talking about SS-20 backfire bombers and a host of shorter range systems that they are deploying today, then clearly uh, the incentive for breakthroughs must be based on uh, compensatory or corresponding buildups on, on our side. If we go into those negotiations with an empty hand, uh, there's hardly an incentive for the Soviets to negotiate limits on their own systems. Well, there's hardly any question about that. Uh, this SALT II agreement will deal essentially, but not exclusively, with uh, central strategic systems, mm -hmm. systems which uh, are intercontinental in character. Now, there are some limitations uh, in the protocol of SALT II, which will involve the ranges of cruise missiles. And in that sense, uh, this is a matter of concern to our European allies uh, in the context of the limits of that protocol and the ability that they will have in the intervening period to prepare uh, systems which will counter uh, ongoing Soviet improvements. Well, I don't know that I would characterize it by uh, any particular adjective uh, or adverb. I'd say that uh, in general, our Soviet or our European allies uh, strongly support our efforts to achieve a breakthrough in SALT and they will uh, inevitably uh, support SALT too, at least in the initial uh, discussion of it. They are concerned about this protocol I mentioned. They are concerned about uh, their ability to enjoy uh, the transfer of American technology uh, as they perceive their own modernization needs. And finally, they're concerned about whatever commitments we should make in SALT two for the agenda for SALT three. Well, it would be presumptuous of me to to answer for they. I think they have felt that uh, initially some concern here. Uh, in the past uh, 12 months or so, the American effort to consult uh, before negotiating and to report following uh, negotiating sessions in Vienna has been uh, very detailed and thorough. Uh, I've made the point, however, that it's uh, important that our allies uh, can sense that there is as much flexibility in the development of American negotiating positions in the process of consultations as we have uh, apparently been able to 
exercised. Well, I think uh, the process uh, when we deal with central strategic systems uh, is quite naturally uh, more yes. bilateral. Yeah. Uh, now, as we get into theater systems, of course, we're dealing with vital interests of our European lives. Well, I think there has been, on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, a great deal of enthusiasm for the uh, cruise solution, the air-breathing solution. And the point I've made is that in purely deterrence, as well as in warfighting terms, uh, an air-breathing system is not a, an equivalent match for a ballistic system uh, by a host of criteria, but the most important being flight time. Uh, from time of launch to time of arrival on target. A cruise uh, is air breathing. It, uh, is, uh, it takes hours rather than minutes to arrive at a target, and a ballistic system it takes minutes. The NATO system. military authorities have made their position on this very clear, and that was that, uh, and I share that position, and that was that this would be a desirable modernization step. At the same time, we've also made quite clear that uh, it's essentially a political decision. Now, I think you know the current state of affairs is that uh, President Carter has put the Soviet Union on notice uh, that he will make a decision based on his assessment of their compensatory restraint and their nuclear and conventional arms buildup. Now, in the meantime, he is uh, going ahead with the production of the components, less the nuclear aspects. So I'm generally comfortable with that, uh, that posture. But at some point, a decision will have to be made. Well, it's a, a vitally important decision for the United States. After all, the United States has, this year, through two summit-level meetings, uh, launched at the, with the vision and courage of President Carter, uh, generated a consensus among our European allies to increase their level of spending. I can assure you, the burdens our Western European allies carry today in the socio-economic sector are every bit as heavy as our own, and in some instances far heavier. And were we to fail, for whatever reason, to meet the sacred obligations arrived at at this summit in our own capital this past May, it would cause an unraveling in the European contributions, in my view, that would be far more serious than the decrements that the United States may have uh, manipulated itself. Uh, over a number of years, American uh, defense analysts have held our European allies to a, a very rigid criteria in defense increases or, or decrements. And they know all the tricks in the NATO family. So it, were the United States to indulge in hanky-panky or slide rule uh, contributions, uh, it will surface and the consequences I've outlined would be realized. Yeah. I think a grievous setback to the progress which has been so promising has been made this past year. There's no question in my mind that the uh, agreement arrived at visualizes a 3% across the board increase in defense spending by the member governments. Well, I think I'd have to leave the answer to that question to the political officials who would have to make the determination. However, I would emphasize that in their discussions with me, uh, senior members of our allied governments have suggested that they will un be unable to hold the line with their respective parliaments should the United States renege.